we continue exploring the interactions between the members of a community, keeping in mind that a community is going to be made up of all of the species of all the living things that are found in one place, the plants, the animals, the fungi, the bacteria, the protists. And uh, we have already discussed the types of competition between members of the same species or intraspecific competition. We've also looked at the competition between different species in one place who want, desire to use a specific resource. And when you have many species competing for the same resource, we are looking at interspecific competition. But now we're going to be shifting our attention to predator-prey interactions. These are going to be easily recognized because the predator is the one that is hunting, is the one that is eating something else. Uh, the prey are going to be those that are eaten. In Bio212, when we talked about animal nutrition and feeding, we focused on strategies used by predators to make their capture more efficiency. Uh, we talked about this optimal prey model where predators are going to be pursuing the type of prey that will give them the maximum energy gain in return for the least amount of effort. But now we're going to be shifting our attention to prey because prey don't want to be eaten and they were going to be developing strategies that will make it easier for them to avoid uh, becoming the predator's next meal. What are those kinds of strategies? Well, let's take a survey, uh, take a look at a few of those. And um, we will begin by talking about mechanical defenses. Some prey species are going to use uh, armor, for example, tortoises are going to rely on that outer covering. Many predators will not be daring to eat something like a tortoise because their fangs or their teeth will never be able to penetrate that uh, protective shield that these animals have. Armor can also be seen in animals like armadillo. Uh, the armor of snails, for example, can be a good example of a mechanical defense. Quills, like those used by porcupines, the one you see here uh, featured in this illustration, the quills that are used for defense, the ones that can penetrate through the skin of prey, are usually going to be on the underside of the tail uh, surrounding the region where the anus of the animal is going to be found. Fangs can also be seen sometimes in animals that are uh, herbivores and uh, even predators at some point in their life may be susceptible to predation. And so those are ways in which they can defend themselves and uh, deterrent an attacker from uh, making prey out of the animal. Now let's take a look at um, chemical defenses. And so in chemical defenses, we can see that sometimes animals can use uh, something like venom. Venom is going to be something that can be injected through the skin of the animal. Uh, there's also going to be poison. And the poison in contrast to venom, it's going to be a chemical that is ingested. When the predator ingests the poison, that's when the effects of that anti-predator mechanism will be felt uh, on the predator. Uh, we see, for example, in this picture, uh, one of these uh, poison dart frogs. I have seen these animals, they are beautiful, but they're tiny in a rainforest in Costa Rica. We call this the um, blue jeans uh, poison dart frog because if you see the from the waist down the animal has this blue coloration which contrasts real nicely with the orange uh, front part of the animal. So with these animals uh, it is going to be the venom, uh, I'm sorry, the poison that is secreted through the skin a predator will regret if they happen to make the mistake to consume one of these types of frogs. Uh, by the way it's interesting that the poison of these frogs is something that they derive from the poison of ants that they eat. Ants produce as one of their defenses formic acid. So the frogs uh, have an immunity, the formic acid of the ants doesn't affect them. Uh, in contrast, actually they end up uh, using that same formic acid in the production of their own toxins, uh, their own poison. Now, the problem with having a poison that is not felt until the animal has eaten the prey is that, well, by that time, it's going to be too late from the perspective of prey. And so many prey species that are poisonous are going to be advertising the fact that they are not 
a good meal for a predator. And so whenever you see colors in nature like this bright orange and the darker blue, or when you see something like yellow and black, like in the abdomens of bees and wasps, those are going to be examples of aposematic coloration. Aposematic coloration explained in simpler words means warning coloration, using bright colors to advertise the toxicity of the prey, and this way uh, predators are going to stay away from those types of prey. Aposematic coloration can be seen in animals like uh, the amphibians. Uh, we've talked about poison dart frogs. Insects are going to be using uh, this type of coloration. Uh, and uh, a number of other animals can also use it. For example, there are some uh, types of uh, rockfish and uh, scorpionfish that are going to rely on bright colors uh, if their disguise is uh, not effective and they get detected, then they can use bright colors to discourage an attacker. Another strategy used by prey is going to be cryptic coloration. And uh, you can see, for example, in this illustration, a frog that has nicely blended uh, with the bark of the tree. And if you're following my laser pointer on this upper illustration, this is the head region of the animal. This is where the eyes will be located. Uh, this is going to be the front leg and the hind leg is going to be nicely tucked underneath the abdomen of the animal over here. Some people say, well, that's like, sounds like camouflage. Uh, but I don't like to call this camouflage because in the case of camouflage, uh, there's usually kind of like a um, dull and uh, plain coloration, which happens to be the case of this tree frog uh, we are showing in this illustration. But cryptic coloration simply means blending with the environment, whatever the environment is doing. Sometimes the environment can be bright. Think, for example, about the beautiful colors of the coral reef. There are many fish that hide in that bright background by also producing bright colors. So here's what I'm saying. I'm calling this type of a strategy cryptic coloration because it just means blending with the environment and sometimes the colors can be bright. Think also, for example, about the bright green plumage of something like a parrot. And if you have ever traveled a tropical country and a place where parrots can be found, sometimes you can hear him up on a tree moving. You can see branches and leaves moving, but you will be uh, lucky if you happen to spot one of those parrots. So the bright green plumage is exactly the type of uh, coloration they need to blend with the bright green color of the foliage of the leaves of the tree. Another strategy is known as Batesian mimicry. And here the word mimicry simply means to imitate. Uh, and so this Batesian mimicry is going to be when a, a prey species that could actually be easy to catch, it would actually make a good meal, is avoided by, it's avoided by the predator because it is confused by something that could be dangerous. And so we see, for example, here, uh, this uh, caterpillar, this is the abdomen end of the caterpillar. The head is going to be over here, but the abdomen can be extended by the animal in the presence of a threat, uh, looking kind of like the head of a snake. Perhaps the head of these kinds of snakes that also live in the same place. And a bird, for example, may see this kind of a display, think, oh, snake is going to eat me and fly away from this type of an opportunity. It could make a good meal, as I said, but they are thinking that perhaps they have encountered one of these real predators, which would be a type of a snake that does feed on birds. And so that's Batesian mimicry. I can give you another example of a, a Batesian mimicry. When you look at the monarch uh, butterfly and the viceroy butterflies, monarch butterflies have this beautiful uh, orange and black pattern. The viceroy butterfly also has the same kind of color. The monarch butterfly actually is toxic to birds uh, and other animals that may eat it. And so because of those bright uh, orange colors in contrast to the black, they are going to be avoided. The viceroy butterfly is actually a good meal, uh, but it is confused by predators like birds as something that is toxic. And so for this non-toxic animal to look, pretend like it's toxic provides a benefit in that it may successfully escape an attacker. Mullerian mimicry 
is another type of imitation. Remember the word mimicry means it's an imitation, is something that is pretending to be something else. And in this case, one toxic species is pretending to be like another toxic species. And look at this example over here. Uh, on this illustration, you can see a type of a wasp with a classic yellow and black alternating colors on the abdomen. Here you see something like a yellow jacket, which is also a type of wasp. But we're looking at two different species of wasps in this example. And so the one, if it happens to be captured by a bird, before it gets eaten, it will sting the bird in the tongue and the bird will have this discomfort for maybe a day or two, may not be able to eat for a day or two, and birds will remember that painful experience. The next time they see an insect like this one, whether it is a yellow jacket or this type of wasp, which they have never eaten before, uh, either way, they will ignore it. They will avoid it because of the previous painful experience. And so while this yellow jacket might have sacrificed the one time a bird tried to eat it, while that one yellow jacket is dead, this one is going to be benefiting by the sacrifice of the other insect that looked like it. And so you may say, well, what was the benefit for this type of insect, which was eaten the first time? Well, the next time, maybe a naive bird, a different one, learning what to eat, may actually make the mistake of eating an insect like this one, like this wasp. They will remember the painful experience, and if the next thing they see is going to be this yellow jacket, now the yellow jackets will be the ones that are ignored, avoided. And so there is a benefit here when two toxic species, two poisonous or venomous species are have this resemblance. They somewhat look like each other. So that's called Mullerian mimicry. Moving on, another type of uh, an interaction you see among the members of the community is going to be herbivory. In this case, herbivores are going to be the primary consumers and the plants they are feeding on, the plants are going to be the primary producers. Uh, here you see, for example, uh, manatee feeding on some aquatic plants. This is probably something like um, Elodia that can be found in uh, brackish waters over by the uh, coast of Florida where the manatees live. Think, for example, about ungulates, animals with a split hoof. Uh, this includes things like gazelles, antelopes, wildebeest in Africa and the grasses that they depend on. And so what these animals need to have in order to digest plant material is going to be a beneficial association with colonies of bacteria. See, cellulose is a polysaccharide few animals can digest. But many animals have developed their own adaptations by making these beneficial associations in their guts with bacteria. The bacteria can digest cellulose, and as they digest the cellulose, they're oozing out of their little bacteria bodies, monosaccharides, uh, and other simple sugars that the animal will later then benefit and use those sugars as their source for the energy they need to complete their activities. So herbivory is going to be herbivores eating algae in the case of an aquatic environment or plants in the case of a terrestrial environment. And finally, one more symbiotic relationship, I'm sorry, one more community relationship I want to talk about is going to be symbiotic relationships. And here we have discussed uh, over the course of three quarters different examples of symbiotic relationships. And so, for example, we talked about Pseudomonas fluorescence uh, during Bio211 as we were doing our ComGen projects. And that's a type of bacterium that forms a beneficial association with the roots of plants. Uh, in this case, the plant is benefiting uh, from the antifungal compounds produced by those bacteria. Uh, what do we call these kinds of as associations of symbiotic relationships? Well, it would depend on what is happening uh, to the guest and what happens to the host. In one, by the way, before I move on, the guest is usually going to be the smaller of the organisms, the one that lives on or within another, and the host will be the larger of the organisms. In the case of parasitism, when a species feeds directly from its host, internally, uh, 
it's going to be the case of endoparasites or externally is going to be the case of exoparasites. And so here in this situation, we can say that the type of uh, relationship in uh, parasitism, trying to move to a pen, can be sometimes described as a plus for the parasite, for the guest, which happens to be an unwelcome welcome guest, unwelcome guest. And for the host, it's going to be like a negative type of a relationship, meaning that the guest obtains a benefit from the living juices, the blood, the sap they may be taking from the host, and the host is going to be suffering. So that's why you see this. Uh, I was just underlining here, by the way, what happens to the two kinds of organisms in this situation. As we move on, commensalism is going to be a situation when the guest benefits and the host is not necessarily benefiting or being harmed by the relationship. And so examples you see here in this picture will be the cattle egret. Cattle egret will be these white birds in the picture and they follow larger animals, herbivores. When these herbivores are feeding or as they are moving through the grass, they're shuffling uh, and uh, exposing insects or maybe small amphibians that these animals are going to be prone to eat. So the bird benefits because it takes less time and effort to find something to eat, whereas in the case of these buffalo in this picture, they don't benefit, they're not harmed by the presence of the birds. And so this is going to be an example of a commensalistic situation, relationship. And so in this case for the guest, there's going to be a benefit, uh, but for the host, I'm gonna write a zero here, meaning that there is no benefit or no harm for the host. Another example is going to be uh, nesting birds in certain kinds of trees where the tree doesn't necessarily have a seed that the animal will help with the dispersal. The bird gets a benefit from living on the tree, getting protection from the branches, and, and so, but the tree actually, it doesn't have a benefit and it's not harmed by the presence of the bird's nests on its branches. One more relationship I want to uh, remark on here is going to be mutualism. And so mutualism is going to be when the guest and the host are going to be benefiting each other. And that's typically the case of an animal like the one on the picture. You can see here this, um, uh, clownfish and the anemones, the tentacles of the anemones are going to have uh, nematocysts, those are stinging capsules that can be used for protection for the anemone itself. But this fish over here has a, a mucus coating, uh, the same kind of mucus that this anemone is producing, so the anemone doesn't attack the fish, but the anemone will attack other fish that come close to this clownfish and vice versa, the fish can also defend the anemone from other herbivores or other predators that would have a taste for anemone and have immunity to the stings of the anemone. So they are both defending each other, they are both benefiting, and this is going to be one of those plus and plus situation. The guest benefits and the host also benefits. Lichens is another one of those situations. We're looking at lichens in labs last week. Uh, that's a positive beneficial association between algae and a fungus. The fungus, remember, is usually an ascomycete, and algae cells will be living trapped inside of the tissues, uh, inside of the mycelia of these fungi. Sometimes can also be cyanobacteria. Uh, what about some of the other relationships we've seen here in this presentation with regards to the benefits? Uh, herbivory, uh, here the herbivore is going to have uh, a benefit, definitely they are getting energy, but this is going to be to the decline of the plants that are being eaten. So this is one of those plus minus types of community relationships. Uh, when you look at predators and prey, and uh, this is going to be one of those, again, it's a plus for the predator who is getting something to eat, it's getting energy, but it's going to be a minus for the prey that are eaten. And so that pretty much covers the main points about community interactions that I wanted you to focus on and uh, to enjoy as you're learning more and more applications of life's concepts and how life works 
at the broadest levels, such as the communities and the ecosystems.